the teaching I'm going to be relaying is not my own particularly. I mean, it must come through me because I'm doing the talking. It's basically the work, the investigative work and the meditative work done by a monk, a Thai monk, over the years, mostly in the previous century, not so much in this, because he died in 1993. His name was Buddha Dasa. He came from southern Thailand, the southern part of Thailand, a small fishing village on the southeast coast called Pungrian, which curiously, excuse me, I'm going to disturb this microphone a little bit, which curiously is a Muslim stronghold. It's a Muslim fishing village. Thailand at one time was dependent on fishing, and both the Buddhists, the Chao Put, and the Muslims, the Chao Islam, they both fished. Uh, these days, most of the Buddhists have taken to opening hotels and resorts on places like Gosamui and Pangan, and mostly five-star resorts, while the Muslims have stayed uh, more as they were, and they're the ones who do the fishing. And Pungrian is now dominated by, by Muslims. It's kind of strange that one of the thinkers in, in Thai Buddhism, one of the recognized great thinkers, should have been born in such a place, but there we are, that's the way nature works. It's not always explainable. Quite why he became what he became is also something of a mystery, perhaps, but why people become what they become, I suppose, is always something of a mystery. Now, what he did, Thai Buddhism, as I first encountered it back in the 80s, uh, was not a very appealing process or business. Immediately, one wondered what were these monks doing, dressed in yellow robes, looking like monks, but certainly not behaving like monks. And this is precisely what turned Buddha Dasa into the sort of monk he became. Let me just go back a little bit and relate his, some of his history, not too much. We don't have time to, to waste on such things. Uh, what he became was a Buddhist monk. He ordained at 20, following the normal tradition in southern Thailand. He came from a Chinese Thai family. He had a small business in the town of Pungrian. He ordained at 20. He may have been a novice before that even. I'm not sure about that. And studied in the normal way, so he would have followed the normal trends of understanding and thought that dominate Thai Buddhism and the way it was taught, uh, both to lay people, but mainly to monks. At some point in the process, he took the naktam, or sat what they call in Thailand the naktam. These are examinations. And the subject is the Thai script, the Buddhist scriptures in the original language, the Pali language. So it's a bit like learning a musical instrument. I did this uh, over a period of years on two or three occasions, different instruments. And what you do is you learn how to play the thing at the same time, you're learning how to read music, excuse me. <coughs> and you may also learn how to compose music, which I also did. And so when you take the naktam, you study for the naktam, and you learn the Pali language. So you can read the scriptures in the original language, because the questions you're going to be asked are all on paper, all in Thai, of course, and are all couched in Pali terms. Uh, Buddha Dasa did this, and to do it, he went to Bangkok. It's not necessary to do that. Um, you can do it locally these days, but in days gone by, you sat the examinations in Bangkok, and you did your study in Bangkok. But he came from the countryside, all right? He was a pure monk, a good monk, one who lived according to the rules of Buddhism, according to the Patimoka rule. He, he kept himself pure and did what he was supposed to do. Uh, but he, he kind of had a nagging feeling that perhaps it wasn't quite right what he was doing. He had this feeling even before he went to Bangkok. Uh, when he went to the big city to, to sit and to study for the Naktam, he then came into contact with what I came into contact with almost a century later, in the true nature of Buddhism as it operated outside of the small community he was born into, became very obvious to him. And what became very obvious that this was surely not what the Buddha intended. Um, some kind of superstitious belief was dominant. It didn't seem to have any real purpose. It was not designed to liberate anyone from problems make anybody's life particularly better, more to keep people working in a certain superstitious way. And so he decided, while he was in Bangkok, from what he saw and experienced as time went on, that all right, the examinations were useful, they would turn him into a maha, a maha terra, whatever. He would have a kind of degree and a title which he would maintain even if he ceased to be a monk. So it kind of gave him an education and elevated him in society, but didn't seem to do much for his mind. He didn't get any peace of mind from his efforts. And so he began to investigate in his own way, even while he was in Bangkok and still studying for the Naktam. He began to understand that maybe the Buddha was aiming in a different direction, an intellectual study was very little to do with the realities of Buddhism. There are different levels of study and practice in Thai Buddhism, in all forms of Buddhism. 
One of them is very basic intellectual knowledge which you gain from studying books, scriptures, things like this, to learn what the Buddha taught about. This includes learning meditation techniques, but in particular learning about what they call the Dhamma, which ultimately has the meaning of ultimate truth, but which can also mean the Buddha's actual teaching itself. You learn the ins and outs of what Gautama discovered, how we, have, how we function as human beings, why we function as human beings, what our problems are, and most importantly, what we can do to get rid of our problems and what life can be like if we can get rid of our problems. Um, this involves a way of life which was obviously not being uh, observed in Thailand in Buddha Dasa's youth. And finally, from his own investigations, he began to realize that, well, if he wanted to really understand what the Buddha had to say and put it into practice in a reasonable way and get some proper benefit from it, and by doing that, maybe teach other people to do the same things, he was going to have to go his own way because as far as he could see, nobody else was making the effort. Now his monk name was actually Indapano. Buddha Dasa, or Putta Tat in Thai, means slave of the Buddha. Indapano does not, it has a different meaning. He changed his name when he decided to dev devote himself to uncovering just what the Buddha was actually teaching, or at least trying to do that. Instead of just following the normal trend, as, as Thais do when they ordain and become monks, they just go to a monastery, learn about the first four trainings, the first four precepts, the first four rules of, of, of behavior, which are what they call defeats, and very often don't even bother with the rest of the so-called patimokha, which points out how monks should function, a list of 227 training rules, which you should be aware of. It's usually the first four because they're considered to be absolute defeats if you indulge in them, if you cross the, the line of them, then you cease to be a monk. So as far as most monks are concerned, this is about all they know about the basic rules of being a monk. They may study further if they feel inclined to, but they're not generally encouraged to do that. And Buddha Dutt, of course, discovered all this, saw the problems involved and decided to go his own way and go into the Buddhist scriptures himself. And with the help of one or two like-minded individuals, one of whom incidentally was a, one of the princes of the royal family at that time, who had also been a monk, he began to scratch away at the Buddha's teachings and to try and uncover just what he was actually trying to teach, what the Siddhartha Gautama had really had to say. When he did this, he ceased his examinations, he ceased his studies in Bangkok. So he only got to the third level of Pali studies. There are actually nine levels. If you complete all nine, which many monks do, of course, then you become a, a kind of doctor or master, if you like, in, in English. It's like a master of arts, master of, of whatever. An MA is what you get out of your name. You can get a BA from achieving what they call Maha status, and you become a Maha monk. They call you, you have a kind of title. So when they talk to you, but they, they mention your name, they always include the prefix Maha. A Buddha also went that far, the first three levels of Pali. He conquered, but he could see no point in, in going any further, at least in the way he was being encouraged to go. So he then retired to southern Thailand again, came back to Pungrian. Um, and moved to Chaya, moved to an old deserted temple in Chaya, and decided he would try and put into practice what he'd now come to know about the true way of Buddhism. And the first thing he became aware of was that the Buddha, of course, lived most of his life outside. He didn't really live in temples because there weren't any temples he could live in at the time. His style of teaching was different from the norm. He had to make his own way. The disciples he gained, the followers he gained, they, they lived the same way he did, mostly out in the open, except during the rainy season when they were forced to take shelter. And there are many parts of the scriptures which describe just what the Buddha did when he took shelter. He lived in cow sheds, anything at all. It sheltered them from the rain. It was not a glamorous way of life, the way it's become in Thailand now. There are no glorious buildings with gold leaf all over them, and highly decorated and stuff like that. So Buddha Dasa began to develop the old disused temple in Chaya, which became the first version of what is known in Thailand as Suan Mok. Suan Mok means Garden of Liberation. Suan means garden. Uh, moksha, Mok is the Thai version of Moksha. It means liberation, so Garden of Liberation. The name of the actual temple would have been different. I'm not too sure what it, what it was. That was where he began the process of, of, shall we say, rectifying some of the wrong understandings of what the Buddha had been teaching, what his teaching was really all about. As the years went by, he picked up followers, mostly among the intellectuals, because the style of teaching he offered um, appealed to them. It required quite an effort to understand some of the things he had to say, because he was no longer um, 
satisfying themselves with simple explanations of things like reincarnation into a nice new life and what you need to do to get that and how you need to live as an ordinary ex uh, um, in, uh, Thai person to achieve, shall we say, a, a future art incarnation which would be higher than the one you have at the moment, which of course is very much still the case in Thailand, is why Ch Thai Buddhists are still Buddhists. And more, more was the case in, in Buddha Dasa's youth, superstitious belief was the dominant belief. And Buddha Dasa pointed out that mainly Thai Buddhism was Sayasat, what they call Sayasat, or, which means superstitious belief. Another term he used was Nom Nai, which means blind belief. People were just blindly believing what they'd always been taught the Buddha was actually saying, what he had to say. And so now he began to try and open up people's minds a little bit. And this all started when he came back to, this, to southern Thailand and began to develop the place called Suamok, or Old Suamok, as they now refer to it because he didn't stay there for very long. Now he's still not satisfied because he was living not in the way he perceived the Buddha had lived. He was still not living in the open, as it were, with nature as he believed it ought to be done. This was the way Siddhartha Gautama had gained his enlightenment, his so-called liberation. And so surely other people, if they wanted the same result, would have to operate in the same way. So, having spent some time in the old Suamok, he then decided that the time was right. People were willing to make donations to give him land to, to develop his ideas further. And so he moved to a new site, which is where the modern Suamok still is today, uh, which has changed considerably, of course, as the modern world has changed. But at the time that he moved there, it was basically a series of hillsides, as Suamok is. It's quite an undulating place. It was forest. There were no roads. A few houses so he could collect arms, which is what Buddhist monks do or should do. Few of them do, unfortunately. It's what we should do. Take a bowl in the morning and just go and stand outside someone's house until the dog bites you or they give you some food. He started to, to do that, but there were few of those houses around, but that didn't deter him because in the Buddhist time, you know, people didn't generally live in, in, in this, it didn't live in a much different way. The Buddha had to walk long, long ways to get his food very often. So he was quite happy to do that, and the place was just forest and undulating woodland mainly. There was nothing there, no buildings, no roads, no communications of any kind. In the early days he simply lived in the forest, wrapped himself up in his big robe with the other one too, and just slept under trees. There were tigers and all sorts of things wandering around in that part of Thailand at the time. So he was brave to do that because he knew the dangers. Of course, a hungry tiger could be <laughs> a really dangerous thing, but he survived it. He survived it and gradually became quite famous because of the way he was living and began to get other people coming to live with him, not all of whom were like-minded. They liked the idea of living with this burgeoning famous monk. This was a name that was on the rise and so they liked to associate themselves with him. And such people generally don't stay for too long, they soon fall off. He did gain proper disciples, you might if you want to use that term. The Thai word for disciple is luxit. He picked up a few luxit. Luk always means child. The so luxiti, I suppose, is, is a disciple in the sense of becoming related to somebody. He, began, he picked up a series of people which gradually increased in number. And Suamok grew, his influence grew, his style of teaching grew. Always he was looking to destroy the superstitious understanding of Buddhism. And this, as he became more famous, he became more famous for, and in some cases more notorious, I'm afraid. Many like-minded people came to stay with him. Eventually, the temple of Suamok, the Wat of Suamok, as the Thais call it, uh, grew until today it's a monolith. It's not a very pleasant place anymore, I'm afraid. But during Buddha Dasa's day, it was, it really was the Garden of Liberation. And the people who went to stay with him often became very elevated beings. They practiced the way he practiced. They practiced in his style of practice, which as far as he was concerned, was the practice that the Buddha had developed and used himself and which had come to be known and which has been passed down over the centuries under the title of Anapanasati Bhavana or Pawana as the Thais say. Mental development by using the breathing basically. The title of Anapanasati, if you translate that word into English, is mindfulness with breathing. This became one of, his star, one of the star points of his former style of teaching. The meditation practice the Buddha praised and the Buddha used apparently. The Buddha gained his enlightenment by developing fully and completely. The other part of his teaching involved what the Buddha had to talk about. Now the Buddha talked about dukkha. If anybody asked him, according to the scriptures, what is it you teach? Master Gautama would say, I teach dukkha. 
nothing else. Sometimes he would say, I teach dukkha, and I teach the end of dukkha, in case they were looking a bit perplexed. That was all he was concerned with. But of course, there were other things involved which he didn't mention. Dukkha, the cause of dukkha. These are what they call the first of the Arya Satcha, the, the noble truths. The first is dukkha, the second is the cause of dukkha, the third is the end of dukkha, the third noble truth, sometimes referred to as nirvana in the Sanskrit language, nipana in the Pali language, liberation from all the unnecessary problems of life. The fourth noble truth is the Eightfold Path, the Magga, the path of eight stages, which is not an actual path of practice, but it's the way a human being should function if they want to experience nirvana and to maintain that experience rather than just have a quick flash of, of insight into truth and the joyfulness that comes with it. So Buddha Dasa worked in this way. He took the basic um, Buddhist scriptures, scarred them, understood them in a deeper way, changed the understandings, the meanings of some of the Pali words. He continued to study Pali. He was no longer doing it in an official capacity of taking examinations. He saw the uselessness of that, ultimately. Just having Maha before your name was, was not something that interested him particularly. He began to really put this stuff into practice himself and expected and got the right result apparently from the people who came to live with him. And so Suamot became famous, began to become famous as a place where you really could um, understand perhaps on a deeper level what the Buddha had to say. And superstitious belief was not ever a part of the Suamot teaching, at least not while Buddha Dasa was alive, sad to say. Times have changed, but that's the worst is bound to happen when you're, the leading light leaves the planet, dies, disappears, then the style of teaching, um, the maintenance of which really depended on him being around and active. I never met the man. He was dead before I came to Suamo, but not by much. I was on my way to India in 1993, and a friend of mine had been at a retreat that was and is still held in Suamok Nana Chat, Nana Chat, Nana Chat, this kind of means international in a loose translation. They hold retreats, English speaking retreats for foreigners and still do. In 93, Buddha Dasa was still alive. He wasn't teaching the retreat, it was not something he was inclined to get involved with too often, although he did occasionally do it. And he told me, because I mentioned to him, I would have liked to have met him, met Buddha Dasa. He said, Well, you can't, I'm afraid. He's just gone into a coma, and it looks like it's the final act of his life, which it indeed turned out to be. He died a few months later, despite um, strenuous efforts to try and keep him alive. He was 83, I think, by this time, so he, he was old enough to die. But his teaching remains. What he did was he uncovered and changed many basic understandings of the way the Buddhist teachings were supposed to be understood, influenced many people caused a lot of alarm in certain circles because obviously there are many people who there's a great resistance to the Buddhist teachings being understood in any but the official way. We can look at some of this over the next few days. We can look today, in the remaining time we have left, at the, one of the main sources of his interest, which was the practice of anapanasati, the meditation practice referred to as anapanasati. This was, and according to the scriptures, the actual practice of this character, Siddhartha Gautama, who became the Buddha. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with Buddhism at all, the founder is a man referred to as Gautama, often Master Gautama at the time of his life, uh, sometimes by Westerners as Siddhartha which is okay. It was a personal name. I think it probably would not be the sort of thing you would have done in India at the time the Buddha lived. You would not use people's personal names, but we don't live in India 2,500 years ago. We do not live in the northern desert. Hong Kong is not the northern desert. At least it doesn't look like that to me. So, the Buddha practiced in a certain way, and anapanasati is a reflection of what he did. Let's get that straight before we start. He didn't sit down in a shed or a hotel room and try and work something out. I know we'll have this first, because that makes sense, and it's what my master taught me. Then we'll do this, 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 and this, and maybe somebody will get enlightened from this process. He actually did certain things. Now, he had two teachers. The Buddha had two, two teachers. What he was originally was, according to legend, an Indian prince. But we must be careful here because my investigations into Buddhism, like Buddha Dasa's, reveal a rather different story. Sure, his family was elevated. He came from a rich family, a family who had power, 
and influence and connections. But he came from, according to Basham, who was an English Sanskrit professor, which is where I get a lot of my information concerning actual, the actual Buddha's life and other things that I'm interested in. You can't really get the nitty-gritty from simply studying the Buddhist scriptures. You have to go outside to people who made specialist studies in other areas which were connected. Arthur Llewellyn Basham also um, investigated Buddhism to some extent, but Hinduism to a larger extent, which will also be something we'll deal with as we go along. He, he, he came up with some surprising results. But one of them he came up with, one of the surprising pieces of information, was, well, the Buddha lived in a federation of states. Siddhartha Gautama was born into a family which was part, lived in a small country or a small area of India which considered, was considered to be a federation, part of a federation. They weren't states because in India in those days it, there were no states. The Indian subcontinent was not considered to be a country, of course. And the Buddha lived in the northern part of it. He never had anything to do with the south, so he knew very little of what was south of the border, you might say. He was born around the Indian northern border, which borders onto Nepal these days, a place called Lumpini, which still exists, but is actually in Nepal in modern times. But that was part, I can't remember the name of the place he was born into. It is mentioned, obviously, in the scriptures. But it was part of a federation of, of these small countries which probably came together for safety. Because in those days, India was, in a, was, was always undergoing changes. There were wars and battles being fought all over the place. But we needn't um, trouble ourselves with that. The fact is, it was a federation, so there was no real king of that federation of states. It was quite an enlightened system, if Basham is to be believed. And I tend to do that. He seems to be a reasonable character, does the right kind of work, says things in a sensible way. Anybody living in this federation of states, no matter which state they lived in, or country, federation of countries, if you like, well, had, if they were influential in the way the places were governed, in the laws that were created, and the rules of, of life that were promulgated, had the right to call themselves Raja. But it didn't mean that they were a king. It just is rather like in England. If you do certain things, like you brown nose the government enough, you get called Lord or, or Sir. They give you a title. Well, they did the same thing, apparently, in this, this particular part of ancient India. So Siddhartha Gautama, if he was a prince, his father had to be a king. Now, Raja can mean king, of course. Maharaja, great king. But it doesn't always mean that. And it hasn't always had the same meaning. People just assume that Raja means king. And it certainly can. And in a modern sense, that's how it's understood. But in the Buddhist time, apparently, it, was, it did not mean that at all. It was just some elevated person had the title Raja, but it didn't make them a king. And so the Siddhartha Gautama was a prince is, is probably what the English call apocryphal. It's not quite right. It's a little bending of truth. And of course, if you're going to, it's probably been helped in Thailand and other countries which have adopted Buddhism as a religion, because then it becomes a social glue, a social tool. And it's good if the founder of your religion was in some way elevated, I suppose, to a certain kind of understanding. There's an interesting difference here between Christianity and, and religions like Buddhism, national religions like Buddhism. Uh, and uh, Christianity is quite the opposite. The founder of Christianity, if you think it was Jesus, was the son of a carpenter at best and was born in a stable. So it's a very different philosophy of life at work, but we don't need to go in that, into that. So the Buddha was, was born probably into an elevated family. Now he experienced problems in his life, which everybody does. Feelings mainly of dissatisfaction, um, primarily because life is a changeful process. I think we're all aware of that. It's never the same, really, from one day to the next, one moment to the next, in truth. It's up and down, up and down, up and down. And given what they call human ignorance, which we'll explain as we go along, then we tend to make problems out of the up and down nature of life, which we can dispense with. These problems are referred to by Buddhists as dukkha and so really form the first of the Four Noble Truths, which is what the Buddha eventually taught, and nothing else, I teach Dukkha. But he had to discover these problems for himself and get rid of them before he knew how they could be got rid of. So he needed to know the cause of Dukkha, as well as what life was like once you got rid of Dukkha, but he also needed to understand how a human being then should function permanently during the rest of their life, so they would never have the same problems again. So he must have had some inkling of what dukkha was, even as a child. And most of us don't, even though we experience it continually. Life is an up-and-down process. It is essentially an unsatisfying experience. 
it has concepts associated with it, like sickness, illness, and most frightening of all for us, death. So there's a lot of mental disturbance to be had from living life in a certain way, which the Buddhists would call an ignorant way. You get a lot of mental disturbance, which most of us must be aware of, but are not inclined to do anything much about. You're here practicing yoga, you don't do this for fun. Well, you might, but I doubt it. It's an indication that you feel the need to change your life in some way. Okay, it's mainly physical, but you know yoga is not. Nigel knows this, he teaches it. He knows it's mentally connected, it's connected to the way the mind functions. You practice eight kinds of breathing, you do this to increase your health, to do various things of that nature, but also to reflect, to, this reflects on the mind. The body and the mind are kind of interconnected processes, the breathing is connected with them also. The Buddha must have discovered something about life as a young child that made him want to change and made him start to try and discover some way out from the problem of dukkha. He must have felt it more keenly than most people did. And from the scriptural descriptions of him as a child and a young man, it seems that was the case. He lived a probably quite luxurious lifestyle if his family were as elevated as we said they were. If they were rich and influential, then of course he would have had the best of everything probably. But there wasn't enough. I'd been in a similar circumstance, not quite as elevated as, as the Buddha may have been as a young man. It doesn't bring mental satisfaction, doesn't bring mental peace to have money and a nice place to live and all the rest of it. Yes, it's, it's, it's nice to be clothed in, in soft materials and to have all the best things around you all the time, to eat good food, drink good wine and go to good places and have rich, expensive friends and living that kind of system. But all it made me was angry, in as much as I had that experience. I did on a lower level. All it really ever made me was feel more and more unsatisfied. So I too, in my own small way, experienced something perhaps more keenly about life than most of my friends seem to. Enough to make me want to live differently and to begin seeking for some way to cause my mind to shut up and stop being angry and arguing with me all the time. To have some peace of mind, I began to seek for something. And the same thing happened to Siddhartha Gautama as a child and then as a young man. But with him it was much more intense because he took the process the whole way and became a Buddha. But originally he was probably a lot like the rest of us, no different. He might have been perhaps slightly different in his mental makeup in that he was able to experience life more keenly even before anybody taught him the ability to observe life in a more keen and a more penetrating way. So he must have been aware of the problem of dukkha. Now it's basically anything unpleasant, this is the meaning of dukkha, but you need to refine it to understand what the first of the Four Noble Truths is. It's not all the forms of dukkha so much as the mental disturbance that comes from the fact that life has its ups and downs and its disturbances. They affect us because of our ignorance, our lack of knowledge concerning the nature of life as we live it, the nature of ourselves, our own true nature, the true nature of the world we live in. Now this is a second noble truth which the Buddha eventually discovered fully and completely. And we can reveal that no problem at all for people who, who don't understand anything about Buddhism. You need to know that the second noble truth is a noble truth of craving called tanha in the Pali language. Now this is a certain kind of desire. It's not a desire to stay alive or go to the toilet or eat food in an ordinary sense. It's a desire for stimulation or delight it's a d desire for excitement, which is the basis of modern societies. Consumer systems are built on this human un misunderstanding of the way things should really be. Once you start to fall into desiring these kind of experiences, it's very difficult to be satisfied with anything less than that. So we're not interested, for instance, in just eating the food we should eat, which might well be just grass and toenails for all we know. We're more interested, as I am, in eating cream cheese and things like this, because it's delicious and it stimulates the mind and therefore the fact that we have a lot of mental disturbance we don't need to have, it kind of helps you to deal with those kind of things. Think about it. People like to read books. In Thailand they tell me, before a certain time there was no such thing as a novel. Everything was religious. So boring and nobody ever read it. Only the people who were religiously inclined and they read it in a superstitious way. Then novels began to be introduced and then movies began to appear. Now, if you look at modern society, it's full of things that stimulate human beings because these are the things that we seek. We have the problem of dukkha because we seek these things. They're constantly causing the mind to be in tumult for a reason we'll come to shortly, which is a little surprising for people who know nothing about the Buddhist philosophy, the Buddhist basic teaching. 
So the Buddha was discovering this stuff as he went along. It was, he wasn't a Buddha, he was still a kind of normal individual seeking ways out from the problems of life. And therefore he was learning to use techniques to understand life more accurately, not just to do something about the nature of life, but to first of all develop a deeper, more complete understanding of himself as a human being. He was beginning to learn to meditate, because meditation in the old days in India existed long before the Buddha was around. Breath-based meditation techniques have always been known. They might not have been used specifically to quiet and calm the mind to achieve a state of, of mind in which one could experience, for instance, reality. Because Buddhists insist, the Buddha would insist, that we don't live in a real world, we live in an illusory place created by our own minds which is a result of the way we, 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 we understand ourselves and the way we live, constantly seeking, desiring stimulation. This is the second noble truth. We're stuck in this kind of lifestyle, we can't escape from it easily, so we're always going to have mental disturbance. Now why is that? Because it doesn't tie up so easily. Okay, desire, right, you want some stimulating thing, it arises, it disturbs your mind in a pleasant way, and therefore any un unpleasant mental disturbance can be kind of covered over by it. It's a bit like using a plaster to cover over a cut or paracetamol to get rid of a headache. It doesn't do any good ultimately, but it kind of shields us from the worst effects of the way we live. The dukkha is, is manageable by using these various devices. Alcohol is another, smoking cigarettes, taking drugs of various kinds, you name it. Life becomes a kind of addiction. We constantly have the problem of dukkha for the reason that the Buddha eventually discovered and which is what liberated him. He discovered the mechanism that causes the misbelief or misunderstanding of what is living life is me. And he discovered that desire for stimulation is precisely what promotes the feeling of self in the human mind. Essentially a human being is void of anything that could be called a self or any abiding principle whatsoever, whether you want to call it a soul or a spirit or anything else. The Buddhists deny this and the Buddhist teaching comes from originally from Siddhartha Gautama. He discovered this from his own efforts from developing his practice. And the practice he used eventually became known as anapanasati. Eventually not only understood the source of the problem, that it was a misunderstanding of his own individual being, what was living life was basically the mind in connection with the body, which is what receives sense experiences and allows the mind to react to sense experiences by telling the body to do certain things. This is what he experienced eventually 100%. That there was nothing else involved in that equation. There was no me doing anything. It was simply a natural function, a function of nature, put together by nature. A sense experience would arise at the eye, the eye would see something. It would then go to the mind to be interpreted by the mental processes of feeling, perception and thought. And then the mind would react to it. But that was all that was happening. But as far as we're concerned, because normally our mind's disturbed by dukkha the whole time, and by the seeking of sensation to get rid of dukkha and never in a condition to experience the basic truth of anything let alone our own true nature so we're never really aware of this basic truth of life we don't even know most of the time the extent of dukkha we can tolerate it so we don't really investigate it we don't sit down and deprive ourselves of the normal escapes we perhaps don't go too often to 10-day retreats which are a great opportunity to see how your mind reacts when you take its toys away when there's no more cream cheese no more movies, no more books to indulge in, no more cigarettes to smoke or alcohol to drink or anything. How does your mind react then? It's a big shock to most people. The mind does not stay still for a moment. It's very dissatisfied. And so you try to do something to make the mind concentrate, but it won't do it. And why won't it do it? Because it's not me. The mind is a process of nature reacting to natural impulses. That's all it is. It won't do anything that we want it to because we don't own it. We are not it. There's not me, it's not me who's living life, it's the mind. And the mind will follow habit patterns it's created. It experiences disturbance, it tries to escape from disturbance in an ignorant way. And so, of course, it's going to keep on doing that because that becomes a very strong habit. We say we develop habits, habitual responses to life, but it's actually the mind that lives life, so the mind is developing the habits. But let's not get too complicated. I'm talking like I'm talking to people who know all about this stuff already, and this is not wise. Let's backtrack a little bit. So Siddhartha Gautama began to develop his life. He felt dissatisfaction and much in the way I've described, felt it more keenly than most. And so began probably from quite a young age to look for some, for some panacea, something that would make him feel better, less disturbed, less mentally dissatisfied. 
He recognized life, looked at it, investigated it, saw that it was an unsatisfying experience, recognized that the means of, he was using to escape from the problems associated with that were, were kind of temporary things. And so he, he would have begun to seek out something more permanent. It would be from this basis that the practice of anapanasati would have begun to develop. Uh, practice itself is, is basically based in breathing. The first part of it is all about breathing. Um, we can look at it quickly. I think we don't need to go on too much about the Buddha's origins anymore. We really don't have time to go into that much more than we already have. It just gives you some understanding of where the actual practice came from. The Buddha keenly felt before he was a Buddha the need to change himself. Um, the question you need to ask yourself if you want to be a successful meditator is do you feel the same way? Because life has to change dramatically if your mind is going to change its ways. If you're going to destroy your habits of mind, re reordinate the mind, turn it in a different direction, undertake what the Greeks call a metanoia and go in a different direction to the way you've been going in as a human being. Because if you want to be successful as a meditator in any meaningful way, you're going to have to do that. Obviously, Siddhartha felt that way. Now, he obviously felt that way because eventually he threw everything away and went and wandered in the jungle. And he did this for six years. Other people have done it just the same way he did, put a loincloth on and maybe just go naked, live off what they could find on the jungle floor. And while he was doing this, he was seeking all the time for, for some method. He was building his method. He was in, in, increasing his knowledge of how to keep the mind still, how to concentrate the mind. He had a couple of teachers who taught him the basic elements of concentration. These became part of the practice of anapanasati and are basically the part that we're going to look at how to concentrate the mind, how to settle the mind down, how to get it into a certain condition. Now the reason we need to do that is the basic reason for meditation existing. We've already mentioned that Siddhartha Gautama began to recognize dukkha and then understood the cause of dukkha, desire for stimulation, and then saw the cause of a desire for stimulation, um, which actually came from the stimulation, therefore became a kind of interconnected thing, a kind of rotational or vortical experience. The creation of the mind, by the mind, of the feeling that there was something here called me living life. This is known as atta belief, belief in self-existence, ego existence, belief that there is something permanent which always stays the same about a human being, something we're born with that comes from a previous life and when the physical body dies will continue to exist off into the infinite future. This is called atta. And the Buddha discovered the basic truth that what is here is not me. There really isn't any such thing. There is no essence to a human being. It's really just a stream of experience. And it is anatta. It is void of anything you could call an abiding self, soul, or spirit. This he discovered, but he discovered it by developing his ability to meditate, to get his mind into a nice, peaceful condition. You're going to experience, if you're successful, the basic truth of what actually experiences life. This is a very and disturbing and often frightening thing to experience because even though you may have studied and I have many times in great detail over the years the basic understanding of the Buddhist philosophy is, is very deep with me when you actually come to the experience itself it's always a very frightening and shocking experience because you fully realize at least to a large degree if you don't become a Buddha you get close enough so that there's absolutely no doubt that what is living life is not you the illusion of self disappears. It may come back later as your ignorance returns if the experience was not full enough to enlighten you completely. But you know now the basic truth that what is here is not you. This is never going to be a very easy thing to accept. But there's something about insight which you cannot deny. This quality of being truth is not something you will question. Once you get over the shock, okay, life changes in a much more pleasant way. But the original experience is never going to be pleasant. Not the Buddha experienced it eventually by developing his mind in a certain way, by making the mind peaceful. Anapanasati is a long practice. We're not going to look at all of it, we're just going to look basically at the first four steps. But let's just outline it before we begin to do that. It's designed in the first place to make the mind peaceful, to get the disturbance out of the mind. So obviously you've got to change the way you live before you begin to do anything. You need to observe certain moral precepts which exist in all the great religions and are perfectly acceptable, providing they're understood properly. Being moral isn't being goody-goody, it's being a human being. 
You live as a human being should when you observe, for instance, the Ten Commandments of Judaism. You observe them properly, it turns you into a proper human being. Not some tacky, tacky, goody, goody thing. It's the way we should be. Buddhists have five basic precepts, and they're fairly common to all religions. Non-harming or non-killing on a basic level. Not taking what's given, what's not given, that is not stealing, not breaking the law in an obvious way in that sense. Not because you break the law, but you create mental problems when you behave in that way. Keeping your sexual um, activity within reasonable terms for people who live in the world. Uh, sex is part of life, so you don't jettison it completely. You just learn to control your sexual desire and keep it under control, keep it reasonable. Um, there's things like wrong speech, using speech in a correct way, learning not to tell lies, to get the things you need and to avoid things you don't want to experience learning to face up to life in a more truthful way and keeping away from things that deliberately disturb and, and make a mess of the mind. Mainly alcohol in, the, in days gone by. Drugs have been included in more recent times because they do change the way the human mind functions on a very basic level. Alcohol can turn very pleasant people into monsters when they get a little drunk or it can make us into sort of pleasant fools to be around. But whichever way you look at it, it they do change the mind in a very dramatic way, particularly alcohol does this very dramatically. So this, this is just the basis of meditation, successful meditation, is at least attempting to live as a human being should, according to the people who set these, these, these principles down in the first place. And from my experience, absolutely essential if you want your meditation to regularly produce results. Having done that, you can then wrestle with the first four steps of anapanasati practice. Anapanasati means mindfulness with breathing. Ana is in breathing, apana is out breathing. Sati is what they call mindfulness in Buddhist circles. Ana, apana doesn't sound good, so they make it anapana. And sati is all right, anapanasati, anapanasati. Three long A's, two short A's, anapanasati, mindfulness with breathing. The only thing that's difficult there is mindfulness, sati, small word. It's simple enough if we keep it simple. It's the mind's ability to observe itself at all times. So when you're doing anything, like I'm talking to you now, I'm not thinking about what's on the television later while I'm doing this. My mind is focusing on producing a reasonably articulate description of what the Buddha had to say according to Buddha Dasa. I'm trying to stay with that because I'm mindful enough to do it. I don't need to have a book with lots of things written in it. My memory is good. My mindfulness is good enough to bring the information I need in a fairly unpolluted state to allow the mouth, the, the organ of speech, to, to uh, transfer it into, the, into sound waves, which people hopefully can understand. Mindfulness is this. When you're doing something, making a sandwich, you're not thinking about anything else. At the time, you're concentrating on doing what you're actually doing in the moment. Simple. So when you sit meditation, you want to be mindful on the breathing. It's the basis of anaphanacity then you're aware of the breathing in and out. You should strive, therefore, to be properly aware of the breathing in and out and not let your mind wander off into other kinds of thinking because then you aren't being mindful of the breathing in and out. Good thing about mindfulness and breathing is we have both of them already. You don't have to go anywhere or buy them from anywhere. No yoga shop is going to sell you them for a very high price. You've already got them. You breathe every moment of your life, but have you ever really observed it? Those of you who practice yoga have, of course. Those of you who have dived have. You need to learn to breathe when you dive. You need to learn to breathe in a very skillful way. When you practice anapanasati, according to Buddha Dasa's understanding, you're going to learn to breathe in a correct way. Because what you're going to do is, having observed the precepts to whatever degree you can, that is, got your life reasonably moral and balanced, then you also, at the same time, begin to practice meditation in the way of anapanasati. Now remember, what you will be developing will always be mindfulness. Before we go any further, let's stress that. It's not concentration that we're interested in here, because the two are connected. Like I mentioned, learning a musical instrument and learning to read music earlier on. The two go together. You can't learn a musical instrument without learning to read music too. Okay, if you want to perfect the art of reading music, then you make a special job of that. But when you're learning to play a guitar, you must read music because everything is on the stave. It's written on in musical notation. So when you're learning to be concentrate the mind, you cannot do that without being mindful of some particular thing as it happens in the real world moment by moment. Artificial forms of concentration, they always are artificial. 
they're not natural. It's not natural for a human being to focus on one thing for a long period of time and nothing else. Because if you lived in a more normal way, something would eat you while you were doing that. You can't just sit there in the jungle and stare at a tree or a fl candle flame. Some tiger's going to come along and take your head off, and you'd be enlightened quick time. So it's a very artificial thing to force the mind to do this. But we're very artificial human beings. We don't live in a real way. We want to get in touch with our true nature. That would destroy selfishness, excessive selfishness, bring peace of mind, bring what the Buddhists call nirvana on some level. Then we need, first of all, to undertake a form of training that will allow the mind to be peaceful and still enough to see the basic truth of what we are. Now the mind, while it's in a mess, cannot possibly do that which is why the precepts are necessary in the first place. Get your physical life under control, then start to use the practice of anapanasati. Now the first three steps of the first four steps of the practice are all to do with breathing, as is the fourth step. But the aim is different. The first step of anapanasati is to fully comprehend, that is, know all about long in and out breathing. The second step of the practice is to know all about, to fully comprehend, short in and out breathing. The third step is to fully experience all bodies, <laughs> which always causes some consternation. The fourth step is where the accent of the practice changes, begins to go in a different direction, and has the title of calming the body condition. Now, don't, don't worry about any of this. Uh, or we won't have time to go into it in detail, but we don't really need to. The part we need to get hold of is the first three steps, because these are easy to practice, and they're not really about meditation per se. They're not about concentrating the mind so much as getting the body into a condition to allow the mind to concentrate. Now just as your life is going to disturb your mind, then the way you physically are is going to disturb your ability or destroy your ability to meditate. If you can't sit still for long enough, you can't get the mind to focus on an object to the extent that nothing else will matter to become absorbed into the object so real concentration can start to build. Your lifestyle will destroy that and the way you are physically will destroy it. So you need to be healthy, first of all. Now you can make yourself healthier by learning to use the breathing. Just as you can make the body relax and put it in a better state to allow the mind to meditate by using breathing. You want the body to relax, that's the requirement. Now you can't just tell it to relax any more than you can tell the mind to stop messing around and concentrate. Because the body basically doesn't belong to anybody. It will be dominated by the mind, so the mind has somehow to get the body nice and relaxed and calm. Now you can't tell it to relax, or you can try, but what you can do is trick it. You can make the body relax by making the breathing long. So the first step of anapanasati is to know all about long in and out breathing. Now over the centuries there's been enormous confusion over this point. How am I ever going to fully comprehend long in and out breathing? Which doesn't just mean one long in and out breath, but all the forms of long in and out breathing the body is capable of doing it. How am I going to do that? Because normally I never make, my breath is never long. If I don't interfere, I just sit and I breathe, the breath is short and ragged and uneven. Where's the long breathing in that? So how, how can I fulfill the first requirement, dear? Well, it's obvious that you need to do something with the breathing. Surely you can't just sit there and wait for it to become long. And if you force your mind to concentrate, by some lucky stroke you manage to do it, without using long breathing and preparing your body correctly first, and then the breathing might become a little bit longer, but it won't become really long. You won't be able to investigate all the different forms of long breathing the body is capable of doing. Buddha Das is very insistent on this point. Make your breath long, says he. Meditation masters done over the centuries will never go along with that kind of advice. And so would he. He would not normally give it if he was instructing people in the art of developing concentration but he's instructing people in the art of preparing the body so that the mind can concentrate more easily. This is what they call entire gantriyam, a process of preparation. He uses the breathing as he uses the precepts, the precepts to get life under control, and the first three steps of the practice of anapanasati to learn about the breathing first in the first two steps, in the third step to use the breathing to control the body, to make it do anything we want. So the first process of investigation, the first step, the thing you investigate and come to know fully is long breathing itself. It doesn't take too long to do that. You just make your breath deliberately long. So when you're sitting here, you can try it any time. 
You already do this. Some of you have been practicing with Nigel, practicing technique, yoga techniques. You probably know about breath control very well. He finds it very easy to do because he's familiar with it. I teach retreats all the time. People always have a problem with this because, of course, most of them are fresh off the street. They just want to know how to concentrate. They're not too interested in preparing the body to concentrate, to allow the mind to concentrate more easily. And so you sit and you begin to make the breath long. Buddha Dasa said the way you do this is you count in your mind as you breathe in and breathe out. So you're sucking breath in and you're counting as you're doing it. Now you're sensible because you haven't done it before. You don't immediately count to 50 and try and breathe in for that. <laughs> and you don't, because you're going to end up like a balloon, which is counterproductive. It's going to produce nothing in the way of calmness at all, either physically or mentally. So we need to be careful here. You don't jump on a bicycle and go 100 miles an hour down a hill until you learn to control the thing. And you do the same when you, do the, when you learn the breathing. It's the most important step in the practice of, of anapanasati, is the very first one. Learning to control your breathing in such a way that you can make it long and soft and gentle. And so you practice doing this. It's not just breathing in long, but it's breathing in a way that you regulate the flow of breathing. You make it gentle and soft and deep, and you'll find the body will settle down very nicely when you do that. Not immediately, because of course you need also to live your life in a decent way, to allow yourself any chance of success, even at this level of practice. But it can be done, and the, the benefits of it are immediately obvious. The body does respond to long, soft, gentle breathing. But we get ahead of ourselves a little bit. The first step is to investigate long breathing in this way. So in your sitting meditation, that's what you do. You breathe in, you don't worry about concentration, which takes a lot of the burden off your shoulders straight away. What you're developing is your ability to understand breathing, but you're also developing your ability to follow the breath in great detail, which is mindfulness, sati. So you're developing the most precious thing you can ever develop as far as Buddhism is concerned, sati, mindfulness. The thing that will enable us eventually to live life, even if we don't get enlightened or have any insight whatsoever, to live life in a very careful way, because we'll see everything very clearly. Because we pay attention to every in and out breath properly, we can transfer this to our physical life. And making your breath long will also make your health better. This is proven over the centuries, of course. This is well known long before the Buddha was even born, this was known. You could control the body by using the breathing for beneficial health reasons. So your health will become better and you'll have a technique which will settle your mind down because it will settle your body down. Where the body goes, the mind will follow. It just takes a little more time to follow. So you breathe in and you count, says he. What you do is you count as you breathe in. Now you don't count out loud, you count quietly in your mind. And you might start with something sensible like three. A count of three as, if, as seconds would elapse. In English they would say one and two and three. Or and one and two and three. And there you have about three second in breath. And then you breathe out in the same way. And while you're doing that, you're regulating the length of the in and out breath, but you're also regulating the flow of breath. So this is a comfortable experience. And then when you feel reasonably easily about breathing in and out for three seconds, you can move it up. You can increase the count, gradually increase until you get to 10, maybe in, 10 out. It can easily be done once you know how to control the breathing. And then you don't <laughs> fill yourself up with air. So you get to five and you've got five more seconds to go and your lungs are already like a balloon and you're full of stress and tension. Then you breathe out too quickly. You can't breathe out for 10 seconds because the body just wants to get rid of the waste product. <sighs> now you've got nine seconds to keep on doing that. So you regulate the flow of breathing. This is a whole trick. And this settles the body down settles the mind down, the mind will follow. It's the most important part of the practice. Second step is to do some work with short breathing, um, but we don't need to worry too much about that because the main point of this is to get to know long breathing in the first step, but to also recognize the qualities of long breathing and what it does. You're not studying what the effect of long breathing is, you'll do that in the third step of the practice. You're learning about the breathing, but you can't fail to be aware that yes, it does work, when you get used to doing it, when you can control the in and out breathing, it really does cause everything to become slow and calm and very peaceful. And if you keep on doing it, of course, it becomes even more peaceful. And if you've got your life nicely under control, then you're going to be well on the way to real concentration just by using the first step. But let's go further before we finish. The second step is short breathing. 
Now, the first step is pleasant to do, the second step should be unpleasant. Now, short breathing is what takes the mind into full concentration, but it's not forced short breathing. You don't need to practice too much of this to know that short breath, what, what do you feel like when you run upstairs or take any exercise? That it makes you out of breath. And if you're not very fit, <gasps> how does that feel? Is that going to make your mind concentrate? Does it make you feel nice and relaxed and calm? It makes you feel quite the opposite. And normally our breathing is short and ragged. And there's something called pranayama, or breath control, which teaches you to breathe in a more balanced, healthy way. The more breath you get into your body and it's carefully controlled and regulated, the better you feel, the better your health becomes. If you breathe in the normal way, snatch breaths. Nobody breathes properly in this world unless they teach themselves to do it. The problem is that we're always being controlled by our actions, by our, the way we live our lives, by the selfishness that creates in our minds. It makes us very self-centered, very egotistical brings a lot of stress and tension into life, so our breathing becomes stressed and tense also. So the second step is to simply experience the connection between the first two steps. Know what long breathing is like and know what it feels like, what it does to some extent, then try short breathing. You can count to make your breath short if you want, but you don't need to do too much of short breathing to understand that normally it brings immediately discomfort. Just try long breathing for a while, get some result from it, and then change to a short form of breathing some very artificial short breathing, <sighs> like that. And see how you feel after about 10 seconds of that. You'll feel very different to the way you did when you were making the breath long. So in this way, you learn about the two main forms of breathing. But you should be willing to experiment, not so much with short breathing. Just get to know that it's generally associated with unpleasant states of body and mind. That would be enough. Come to understand long breathing more deeply. That's the one that really gives benefit and the one you're going to use as a meditator for a long, long time, even when you become successful by getting the mind to concentrate. It will do that because you will become expert in controlling the way you are physically and the way you live your life. The way you control your breathing is what will eventually get the mind to concentrate. The third step is to experience all bodies, which sounds confusing, but don't worry about it. It was until Buddha Dasa began to look at it. Experiencing the whole body, Sapakayam Pati Samweti is the Pali. I can remember that because I struggled with it for a long time. Sapa means all, whole in the usual translation, W H O L E. Kayang is body or bodies. In this, this, the one I'm talking about now is the more ancient interpretation of the third step. Experiencing the whole body. Sapakayam, all body, uh, patisangweti has the meaning of getting inside something. So the first two steps are, I can't remember the Pali word, but it means fully comprehending, which is knowing all about long breathing, knowing all about short breathing. So it's quite a lot of intellectuality going on there. And when you go into the third step, the idea is you've got some benefit from long breathing and short breathing. And you don't need to do much short breathing. You tend to focus more on long breathing because it's more beneficial. It tends to calm you down, so it allows you to experience in a deeper way just how the body and the breath are always interacting, always mixing together. Thai word is pragop, pragop, combining or mixing. Su and pragop is ingredients. You see it on um, all the things in Thailand. They put the ingredients on the outside. Su and pragop and all the different things, all the chemicals and poisons that go into that to make it delicious. It's listed. <laughs> pragop. So you see how the body mixes with the breath. And you begin to realize, even at this level, something very basic about life. The body and the breathing, of course, are always together. They can't exist without each other. But you experience that the body can be controlled by using the breathing once you know how to do it. So in the third step, you do that. You use your knowledge of short breathing, you make the breath long, soft, controlled, to whatever length you like. You watch the body relax, then you change the style of breathing. Make it longer, watch the body relax more, or bring it up to a shorter form of breathing, and watch the body respond and change completely. And you notice on a physical level how the breath then interacts with the body, and you have experience. You're not just listening to this old bozo telling you that this is so. You know it because you do it, you see it, you experience it. And this is what Buddhism is essentially all about, personal experience, not believing something because somebody's always said it. That's just superstition. This is what Buddhadasa was all about in the end. And so he practiced this way himself, and this is the way he presented the Buddha's practice. Solved a lot of problems because nobody understood long breathing. How can I even start this practice? I don't breathe long. 
You never thought for one minute that they should make the breath long because every meditation teacher will tell you not to do it. I'd tell you not to do it if you're trying to meditate. So the first three steps, you're preparing your body, you see. But don't forget, you also prepare your life at the same time by controlling the way you live. Then you're going to be on solid ground here as a meditator when you step into the fourth stage of anapanasati. This is where the meditation actually begins in this understanding, not in the first step. This is a preparation. Yes, it controls the way your body controls, softens, gentrifies the body, you could say, relaxes the body in a very special way. So there is mindfulness being developed, so you are meditating, you're developing the prime ingredient, mindfulness, by paying close attention to the breath to understand the different forms of breathing. In the second step, you do the same with short breathing, that also develops mindfulness. And then you develop it more when you come to the third step, because you're looking for the result of your breathing in the way you feel physically to begin with. So you can get a little closer to breath when you do that. So you require that you be more mindful to be able to do that. You can really watch the body changing as you breathe in certain ways, and you focus on the body changing, not so much on the breathing and on the body itself, but on the effect that the two are creating as they combine together. Simple, really. So you change the breathing, you make it long, you make it short, you watch the body respond. This is the experiencing all bodies. Why do they call it all bodies? The breath in Theravada Buddhism, which is this form of Buddhism, they usually dress in these kind of clothes, it's a sort of uniform, um, is a body, it's referred to as a kaya, a body. The breathing and the physical body are both bodies. So all bodies, as you know the breath, you know the body, that's two bodies. It's not all bodies though, is it? No, it ain't. But when you breathe in, every breath is different. So every body affects the body in different ways. Now the Buddhists would say that whenever you breathe in, the body is kind of reborn according to the kind of breathing you're doing. So a different body arises as a result of every breath that you take. This is certainly true. Sometimes it's very subtle, sometimes it's very obvious. So when you're being ex asked to experience all bodies in the third step, this is what you aim for, to be aware of every individual breath and every individual effect that it has on the body. It's recreating the body. Each individual breath does that. See, normally we don't have any clue about this kind of stuff. We just breathe in a ragged way and not feel very well most of the time unless we do something about it. It's a great technique, it works. And it brings you to the, to the very threshold of concentration. The way you practice it is simple. The technique is a little different to that normally offered to meditation practitioners because you're not starting at the beginning in steps one, two, and three. You're not trying to concentrate so much as get the body ready to let the mind concentrate easily. You're using the body, using the breath to control the body, basically. So what you do is you follow the breath. This is Buddha Dasa's technique. I don't know where he got it from. He claims it comes from the Kudaka Nikaya, which is part of the Buddhist scriptures. I could well do. I, I thought I'd investigated the Kudaka Nikaya, but maybe I didn't. Or maybe I was reading something else, and it wasn't the Kudaka Nikaya at all. Uh, I certainly didn't find what he said was in there when I investigated, because I never take anything for granted. It's not the Buddhist way. Okay, Buddha Dasa was a great teacher, but so was the Buddha. The Buddha even told his own people, don't just believe me, you get and do it yourself, then you know that what I say is true. I might just be in it for the money, you know, like everybody else, so it's not wise to just accept things. Buddha Dasa was the same, so I take his advice. I try to look everything up that he says to see if it actually comes from the scriptures, and then practice it myself to see if it works. Well, I've been through the whole process of anapanasati, at least the first two stages of it, in great detail. So I know that what he had to say, particularly in the first three steps, it works. And if you approach it correctly, it will take the mind into full concentration also. So it will relax the body and it will also have the result of relaxing the mind. Now the way you practice it is to chase the breath in and out of the body. The Thai term is wing tam. It means chase. Tam is to follow, wing is to run. So you add those two together in the Thai way, which is not always too logical, and it comes out as chasing or following the breathing. It's an unusual technique. Usually you're asked to simply focus here on the tip of the nose. Now if you're just trying to meditate in the normal way, a normal breath-based meditation, that's the advice you will be given. But it doesn't work, mainly because we don't prepare ourselves to allow it to work. If the body is not relaxed and calm and peaceful already, then your mind won't be relaxed and calm and peaceful to any degree. And then being sensitive and mentally sensitive enough to be mindful of the feeling of breath 
as it enters and leaves the body around here is not an easy thing to do. If you make the breath deliberately long, you can do it quite easily. But it's not easy to understand the whole process of breathing, and you're going to have to do that if you do the first three steps properly. So Buddha Dasa says, okay, do it this way. Follow the breath into the body. Now you say, wait a minute, the breath only goes to here. The esophagus is where the breath stops, is where the lungs are. What do you mean, follow it? Follow all the way down. Yeah, that's what you should do. <laughs> it's nonsense. No, it's not. Because it's breathing is a feeling. You can't follow breathing only on a cold day. And you can't really meditate on that. What you're experiencing always, what we always experience is feelings that the mind creates as a response to physical activities. When you breathe in, it's a feeling going over the top of your mouth, over the back of your throat, down to the base of the, to the peak of the lungs, to the top of the chest. You can feel that physically. And if you're making a breath long, it's not difficult to do that. But it stops there. But there's another feeling involved here with the movement of the body. The whole lower body structure moves. Yogic practitioners, you should be aware of this. When you breathe in, the body moves. When you breathe out, the body moves in the opposite way. So you can connect that process into one line of feeling as you follow the breathing in and follow the breathing out. Okay, it's a little troublesome, but it goes back to what we said at the beginning. If you've got to really want to make changes to the way you function to even think about being successful at this, you have to take the time and trouble to do it right. So you learn to do this. It's a little pesky, you've never done it before maybe, following the feeling of breath as far as you can, down to the back bottom of the throat and picking up the movement of the body and connecting the two together into a continuous flow of feeling. Need some practice, it's not an easy thing to do. But it's a lot easier than being frustrated by trying to observe breathing properly at this one place. There's very little in the way of successful meditation in this world, probably because people are given this advice and there is no real preparation exercise undertaken. Just get your life in order, but don't worry too much about it. Because in the modern world, people don't like the idea of morality. Because it's never explained as the way a human being should be. It's not some goody-goody thing, it's the way we should function. So we have to try, we have to practice living in a balanced way. Then we practice controlling the body, and then we have the basis for concentration. So you chase the breathing in, and you chase it out, and you count quietly in your mind as you're doing that. You get used to doing it. You practice this way with long breathing, with short breathing, you practice with all bodies. You investigate the effects the breathing has on the body using the same technique. Believe me, it gets very easy after a while. All the time you're doing this, if you do it accurately, you're developing mindfulness away from its normal state. Mindfulness is something we always have. We don't need to invent it. You watch television, you have mindfulness because your mind has to stay with the object. Well, you might think, well, why do we need to develop it? Well, television is stimulating. If you want a stimulated mind, then you, you have mindfulness and concentration of a certain kind. The concentration is very shallow concentration. No use for seeing truth, for instance. And the ultimate aim of the Buddhist practice is, if you like, to get your life in order so it becomes more peaceful, ultimately to experience the basic truth of what we are, what the world we live in really is. Because really, we never experience things as they actually are, which is an amazing statement when you think about it. You might live 70, 80, 90 years, you don't even know the person you're married to properly, because you don't really understand them as they actually are. You never can until your mind will reflect reality. The only way you can get it to do that is to get it peaceful and calm, so as it settles down, there's no ripples on its surface at all. It's like a reflector. Consciousness is reflexive. And the mind is the same as consciousness on the upper levels, on the high levels. So when you experience anything, the mind is reflecting that. But if your mind is disturbed in any way at all, the reflection will be distorted. So when we look at ourselves, our minds are usually in well, a horrible state. What do we see? We see me. We see a human being. We see all the meanings that we've always expected to see. And when your mind suddenly is right, clear, perfect, when you look in the mirror you, of the mind, you point the mirror of the mind at, you, at yourself, what do you see? you see the truth of what's really there. Not pleasant, I admit, but the results of it are nothing but pleasant, always. So the first three steps then is to go on tree and prepare yourself for meditation by getting your body to function in a more acceptable way. As mentioned, you can't make this happen, you can't simply ask the body to do it, you can force it, trick it by using breathing. And once you learn to do this, then the first step is the only one you need to practice. The second and third steps, once you've done them, to some extent, and you've got lots of time to do that. 
and not while you're here particularly, but if you practice this outside this place, you can take your time about understanding breathing. You'll find the first step along breathing is the one that really counts because it's the one you can always use at the beginning of any meditation session. In fact, you should use. There are basic problems with people who try to meditate. We've tried to make that reasonably clear without going into detail. But one of them is what they call udacha, the wandering mind. This is a basic problem for all would-be meditators. The mind will not stay still. It just wants to think about something else. Why? Because that's what it's always done. It's like a child that's always been allowed to do what it wants. You stop it from doing it, it cries and throws a tantrum. The mind does something similar when you make it watch the breathing. It doesn't want to know. Okay, for the first ten minutes, oh, this is interesting, easy. Yeah, next time you try to do it, you can't concentrate, you can't fix the mind on the breathing for even half a breath. It gets to be so dire that people sometimes quit even trying. And what's happening is our old habits, the way we've lived, is coming back to haunt us. We've always fed the mind with stimulation. Now we're giving it something that isn't. We're trying to make it calm and peaceful. It doesn't want to know. So we've got ourselves to blame. The mind wanders. What's the antidote? What's the medicine for, long, for, the, for the wandering mind? It's a long breathing. Some stable, long, soft, gentle breathing is what will calm the mind down because it's what will calm the body down. There are four other basic meditation techniques, but we don't have time to go into all that stuff. We need a proper meditation retreat to really set this out in detail, give you all the information you need. But we're trying to give you most of it, the stuff that really counts. We're all intelligent human beings. We can work our own way through this. We're going to have to anyway, because I can't do it for you, neither can anybody else. If you're interested, you're going to have to do it yourself. So long breathing is what you concentrate on. Well, how do you practice with just long breathing alone to get the mind into concentration? How do you get from step one to step four without using steps two and three? Easy. You sit, you chase the breath in, you make it long, you control it until you have it under control, until you begin to feel nice and peaceful, until the body kind of lifts a little bit. This could take some time. It's not going to happen immediately. You come to the magic moment sooner or later. The body begins to feel very light, Curiously, at the same time, feels heavy. Sounds like a contradiction in terms. How can it feel heavy and light? Well, it can. Life's a surprising business. You see, we experience it through a glass darkly always. Now you're beginning to see things a little more clearly. You realize that well, it doesn't always work the way you think it does. Heavy and light? It sounds like nonsense, but absolutely is not. The body will raise when the mind begins to focus, once the long breathing begins to take effect. So you chase the long breathing and you keep on controlling the breathing. You don't allow it to be natural. You keep it a certain length because you've discovered a certain length of long breathing from your investigations that suits you. But don't be satisfied with normal breathing. It won't do the job. And then you keep on using that long form of breathing till you become so expert at it, the body disappears. And as it disappears, that's why it becomes lighter. At the same time, the arms and legs and all the usual paraphernalia that we call us disappears too. It feels like a weight at the same time. And then the mind is beginning to respond also. It begins to brighten and sharpen. And what was difficult to do or troublesome to do, like observing the whole process of breathing, suddenly is so clear you can't believe it. It's so simple. Yet before it was a struggle, now it's very easy. The mind has become clearer. It's beginning to concentrate. The body is concentrated, you could say. That's why it feels the way it does. That's why there's no more problem with sitting. Now your mind is beginning to focus also. You start to feel good. You feel a kind of happiness you'd never experienced before. And you know this is working. Gosh, it works. You might be years before you get to this point, but it will arise. And it's worth all the effort just to experience this much, quite frankly. Because then you know there's something more than the normal everyday reality to consciousness. You can be conscious of, of, of life in a very different way. And then it goes further, of course. Now, when this starts to happen, when you feel the body become light and you feel different, and the mind brightens and sharpens, and the process of breathing becomes very clear, this is when you can step into step four, simply by changing your technique and allowing the breath to become natural. Up to this point, you've been making it long and keeping it a certain length until the magic moment arises. You cannot fake that. It has to happen naturally. At that point, you let the breath become natural, and it should immediately drop into a very short, rapid pattern of soft breathing, but not anything like you would normally create. You can recreate it artificially, but it won't do anything because you won't be able to sustain it. It's going to get shorter and shorter and softer and more and more delicate. The breath is going to calm. 
but it's not going to come because you're making it come. It's going to happen naturally. What you've been doing has brought the mind to the point where it's beginning to concentrate. The body has practically disappeared. So now when you stop forcing the breathing, of course, the body doesn't need to breathe. Just a little breath is enough. But you'd be surprised how little breath is enough. The, the breath will practically disappear as you begin to practice the fourth step. It should happen very quickly. The breath will speed up, become very, very fast, very tiny little in and out breaths, and very, very soft, gentle breathing. Now what you're doing now is natural breathing. You're not forcing anything. You've done all the forcing. You've done all the controlling. Now you get the benefit. You simply sit there and you observe right here. Feels like you've got something maybe under your nose, little insect wriggling around. Something trying to escape might feel like that, different for different people. I'm English, so that's what I feel. If you're not English, then you won't. And if you're not English, that's your hard luck. <laughs> so there you go. You feel that little thing under you, it might, like a vortex of air, because the breath becomes so rapid and short. It feels like a whirlpool, something spinning at an incredible rate. And to you, this feels very strong. It's like a hurricane going in and out of your nose. But to anybody else, they wouldn't even see you move. There'd be nothing happening. They might pick up on a mirror some breath, but I think probably not, because the breath will become so tiny. At the same time, you begin to feel something changing about your face. It becomes tense. This is not unpleasant. A mental tightness associated with self-consciousness is what we're normally more aware of. You feel a little tight in your face sometimes, because self-consciousness has that effect with some of us. Well, this is a similar thing, but it's a very pleasant thing to experience, because it means all the power of the mind is beginning to gather on this one place. So your consciousness is all coming here and using consciousness and mind in the same sense. You're beginning to focus the mind. And as it does that, it gets tense. It like, must be something like an electrical field, perhaps. Gradually building, 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 until all your awareness comes to the tip of your nose. And then, perhaps, if you live your life in the right way, you've got everything under control, you might go down this tunnel that leads to the, to the, to the Emerald City of full concentration. Now, whether you go down the tunnel or not, whether you enter full concentration or just approach it, it's entirely possible if you use this technique properly and you follow the instruction and you have the patience to do it right and you feel the need to do it. That's essential because you're changing your life in a very radical way when you do this. You can achieve full concentration. You can know what nirvana is when you do that. You can know what it is if you're mindful enough to ignore what will immediately happen, which you won't be mindful enough to do. Because once the mind begins to approach concentration, gets to the point of access, which is like when you go through a door, you open it. You turn the handle, but you don't actually open and step through. Access concentration is a little light there. You get the feelings associated with full concentration. It's as if they come through the doorway, and you experience a tremendous outburst of joyful feeling, known as piti. If you go through the doorway, you get the full thing. And that usually blows people into next week. But that's the second level of anaphanacity. Uh, you have to pay more if you want to know about that. <laughs>